My job this morning, um, unfortunately, is to make you feel a little uncomfortable. I hope you're okay with that. Um, there is a reason for it, so bear with me. Um, do me a favor, go ahead and take out your devices. I want your iPhones, your Androids, your Blackberries, uh, the key phones, many of you have them out already, iPads that many of you have. I need all of them out. Now what I want you to do, now that you have it out, is to look right and left, find somebody who looks relatively trustworthy, and I want you to trade your device with their device. So go ahead and trade them out. <clears throat> okay, I wanna make, keep your friend's device, and I wanna make three quick observations. Uh, one, there's a whole group of people in this room that are feeling really good right now because you just traded up. <laughs> This is a great exercise. Um, two, and uh, I have two degrees in human communication science, so I love watching people. There's a whole group of people in this exercise when they hand their device over that feels the need to give you a mini orientation session to their device. Look, it does this, it does that. I'm really excited about it. There's another group of people, I don't know the psychology behind this, but it's definitely true, that before they hand you their device, they either lock it or turn it off and then <laughs> hand it to you, right? Which relates to the third observation, which is the longer I let this exercise go, the more the anxiety in the room goes up <laughs> because somebody is touching your device. <laughs> Part of the reason that is, and I want you to bear with me because they're gonna keep your device for the next 10, 12 minutes. Part of the reason that is, is because we have become comfortable with an infrastructure where we have easy access to feedback, to information, to interaction, to data that helps us make sense of our world. In fact, we're a part of this in a way where in our consumer experience, in our health experience, and now coming into our education experience, we're swimming with this kind of interaction and information. In fact, it's so much so that we have become radically comfortable with the powerful use of data to give us that kind of information at the, I mean, at just at the drop of a hat. So all of us use Amazon. How long does it take Amazon to recommend another book that you might like, <laughs> right? And that's a huge data rod. It's data mining about people like you and instant predictive models. It takes them about a week or a month to collate that, put that back together. How long does it take? It takes under a second. It only takes longer because of your bandwidth, right? <laughs> Netflix, iTunes does the same thing. Garmin tells you where you're going minute to minute, step by step, and gets mad at you and tells you to make a U-turn, right? And you're doing this. Even to the point now where we understand the power of this information, interaction, and data in a way where people like Ford have realized they had a real problem with their customers using um, their hybrids. They weren't getting the gas mileage they were supposed to be getting, and they were really upset. And when they did the analysis, they figured out the reason they weren't getting the gas mileage they were supposed to get is because they were driving the car wrong. They were accelerating at the wrong time, they were decelerating at the wrong time. Now, how useful would it be to send the car driver a list of 10 things they're doing wrong in their driving to change their behavior? Not so much, in fact, they got a lot of pushback to that. <laughs> so one of the things they decided to do is they created basically a game interaction feedback model to be able to help with that. And if you look at the dashboard on the screen, what they did is in the right-hand side, they created this vibrant plant that if you drive the car correctly, the plant thrives. The leaves get greener, the flowers bloom. And if you drive the car incorrectly, the plant begins to wither and die. So when your teenage son takes the car and the plant's dead, you know what's going on, right? But all of this is about massive amounts of information, feedback, and resources that are coming back into these. And what they have figured out, this is a big thing, they have figured out in a big way that it is radically important to get the right kind of infrastructure in place to get the right data to the right people right away. Okay. 
And the idea is if you do that, if that is the focus of your work with data, if the focus of your work with data is to build the right infrastructure, to get the right data to the right people right away, transformative things can happen. Now, if you want to learn more about this stuff, there's great resources out there. In the consumer world, if you want to read about Yahoo, Amazon, all the folks who've done this work, you got to read Davenport and Harris's books. They have a couple of them, one called Competing on Analytics. This is a new one called Analytics at Work. But in the world of education, we kind of already know this works. Um, just go back to you know, 1984, Bloom's paper about the power of personal tutoring and closing feedback loops. And what we know is getting the right information to the right person at the right time radically improves learning. We just heard Brewster talk about the notion of customized learning and getting information to that student so you can customize that learning experience. We know this stuff works. If you haven't read the book Mindset, radically, and just powerful book about this notion of academic tenacity. If you want your students to be more, more tenacious, they have to have a growth mindset. And part of having a growth mindset is the ability to do self-regulation. And part of self-regulation is they get information that tells them if they're on track or off track. We really get this. The challenge is we're truly really wrestling in education with trying to, the focus of our data projects. And I'm gonna argue most of the data projects in education are radically off course. They're not about getting the right data to the right people at the right time. And I'll just give you an example. We get really excited about dropouts and retention, and we're at a college, and we pull all the smartest people together to collect that data and pull a committee together to talk about our retention data. After we go out and collect all that information, we come into that committee meeting, and what does everybody do? We argue about the quality of the data, right? Then we go back out and collect some more information, come back and argue some more. Then we go back out and we say, okay, now we think we're, we've gotten the data together, we're not feeling good about our retention rates, let's bring in the faculty. The faculty come in, they're mad they weren't included from the beginning, you gotta start over, okay? <laughs> you go collect some more information, you bring that back together, and now you're pretty comfortable that you have some dangerous data in front of you that tells you something's wrong and you've gotta do something about it, so you bring it up to the administration. The administration's really uncomfortable with the data and wants to make sure that it's clean, and they go out and get some experts to come in and look at it. They find out it is clean. Now they want some comparative data to see how they rate against other colleges that are like them. So they ask you to go get comparative data from other like institutions within your state. Now you have to get data permissions from those other institutions to be able to gather their data, pull that back in, and do a comparison analysis of how you rate against other folks. Now you find out you're kind of middle of the pack, so it's not that dangerous, so you can go ahead and bring it to your board. You bring it to your president, your brewer, you decide to go to the board, you get on the board calendar, it takes you a month or two to get on the board calendar, you present the data to the board. The board says, wow, this I don't really understand what you're doing. Tell me about this. It takes you at least one or two board meetings to get them to buy into the fact that there really is a problem. And so if once they realize there is a problem, the recommendation is to hire a leader to come in and lead the retention initiative to drive the change at the institution. You do a national search. It takes you six months to identify that person, hire that person. That person's first recommendation is to buy software to help you solve that problem. You then have to do an RFP. You do an RFP, you bring in companies, you compete, you pick the right kind of software to take on that challenge, you hire the consultants, it takes you six months to eight months to implement that software and actually do something about it. What has happened to the students about whom you collected the data? <laughs> Their kids have enrolled in your institution, right? Okay. Our challenge, okay, and let's just be gracious about this. If Amazon takes a second to process the data about that person, to help that person make a better choice in that moment. How long does it take us to use a student's data to help them? It's at least a year, right? And somewhere between a second and a year is the balance for us. And if we're thinking about this, part of what we've gotta be thinking about is how we can take on this challenge in some pretty aggressive ways. Now, there's some early projects that have shown some real promise at trying to get data to the front lines. And what I'm gonna argue is the real power of data and education will be unleashed when our focus is not on getting the data to the trustees and the presidents and the legislatures so we can have dashboards and data sets that tell us about evidence-based practice. I understand all the power around that, but what we have seen in the consumer world and what we have seen in the healthcare world is the real power of transformation is when you get data to the front lines. And I'm gonna argue in our world, it's about getting data to students, getting data to teachers, and getting data to advisors and counselors so that they can tune the educational experience and make choices. Does that make sense? Yeah. So there's some early, early work in that. So go ahead and applaud that, because I think that's right. <laughs> okay.
I think what we need to do now is to look at some of the early signs, and there are not a lot of things at scale in this. There's so some really compelling stuff, like you've seen the what core signals work. The core signals work at Purdue. What they basically did, John Campbell did, is run a predictive model against the learning management system and basically put up a traffic light and tell a student when they logged back in, students like you who did the kind of things you're doing in this chemistry course did okay, yellow light. Students like you who did the kind of things you're doing in this course succeeded, green light. Students like you who did the kind of things you're doing failed miserably, stop right now, talk to somebody, red light. And literally that's as sophisticated as the system was radically positive results by doing that. Literally increased success rates anywhere from 30 to 50%. They had to add faculty at the upper division levels because it stopped becoming a weed out course. It became a real success course for students that were coming through. Just by getting simple data about off course, on, uh, on track, off track data right to the students and to the faculty members so they can get a sense of how people are doing in their courses. What we're seeing with the Open Learning Initiative at Carnegie Mellon is trying to give faculty dashboards that tell them where their students are and what the kind of learning needs they need in a blended learning environment. What you see from WCET and the big PAR project they're doing right now, federated the largest data set across multiple institutions we've probably ever, ever seen, and their initial predictive models have basically shown us that you can, be, you can get a risk model in place that tells you with about 90% accuracy whether or not a student's going to be successful. And if they're not going to be successful, they can point to the kind of interventions they need. The other big thing they're finding in their project, by the way, is that there's kind of an e-harmony effect with matching students to programs. And it'd be nice for the student to actually have that e-harmony data, wouldn't it? For them to be able to kind of chart their course in terms of the direction they want to go. Western Governors University, where I work, one of the things we've done is not necessarily leverage the cutting edge technology. Our model actually leans towards this. So what we've done in, in Western Governors University is our learning experience um, is radically different than most online learning. What we have done is we have taken the pathway, the, the, the degree pathway, unbundled it into core competencies with a whole group that has come together and said these are the core competencies and capabilities the graduates need to know. They then have another group that curates the curricular resources. Then they have another group that does the assessments. And then, then the faculty member in direct co coordination and connection with that student, it literally is a mentor relationship, maestros a six month by six month learning journey for those students. So they can then again tune the feedback and say whether or not they're going on the right track or on the wrong track. The idea is the model has lent itself to the idea of getting student information right back to the students so they can tune their learning journey. We're going in the, in the right direction with a lot of these initiatives, but we don't have enough scale yet. And I would argue we have a lot of energy going on right now in the, in the collection of data and the analysis of data and the use of technology. Our challenge right now is to change our focus to think about those student pathways. The stakes are too high. Education is the pathway to possibility. It is the strongest disintermediator of the, the intergenerational transmission of poverty. If you want to change the game, education really matters. It is imperative that right now we change our focus on data to get data now to the front lines, because that is what's going to drive this kind of transformation. I've got one final thought, but before I do, I want you to hand the phones back. <laughs> okay. Hand the phone. Tell them it'll be OK. They survived their little bit. The irony is that was actually really hard for a number of you to give up your connection to that information, to those insights, to those interactions, to that feedback for just 10, 15 minutes. Our students are putting up with that for four to six years. Okay? It's time for us to give their data back to them and have them join us in taking personal responsibility for their learning journeys. If we do it, powerful things can happen. Thanks, folks.